Well, greetings everyone today. Uh, we are going to hear from Paul Jarrett. This is part of our Business Spotlight series. I'm the host, Linda Cry, with Action Coach XL Edge. And it's always wonderful to bring these kinds of um, opportunities to learn and grow and hear what real people as business owners are doing and how we can share the insights and learning. So, Paul, thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule to spend with us today. Well, thank you, Linda. And thanks uh, uh, if you've made it this far here and that I'm going to be on. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, let's just start by telling us a little bit about who you are, you know, what your role is and a bit about your company, if we could do that. Absolutely. My name is Paul Jarrett. I am the co-founder and CEO of Bulu. Um, we recently acquired the business 100% from venture capitalists. So it's kind of a, a restart of a restart, right? Uh, we've been at it for about 12 years. And when I say we, I mean my spouse slash uh, legal owner, Stephanie Jarrett. Uh, she's the brains of the operation. And we started off by um, shipping these sample box, basically consumer package goods. And what the irony of we're basically solving the problem now through logistics and fulfillment. Some people might say 3PL, uh, we'd say 5PL, um, that we encountered when we first originally launched with Bulu Box. So Bulu Box, consumer package goods, a lot of evolution, and now we're kind of right back to that big hairy problem solving it. And um, what we say to people is we help consumer goods brands ship like a major brand. So get on the retail shelf, uh, get direct to customers' doors. Everybody has great ideas. But actually having that package arrive in the correct hands at the right time, the way you intended is actually, um, we, we don't say it's complicated. We say it's complex and it needs to be scalable and repeatable. So that's what we're up to now. Beautiful. So you find a need and fill a need and you're looking for consistency as an extension of a solution for many business owners out there. Yes. Yeah, we are we are all about um, scalable, simple, documented. The less we can do, the better, more focused. Yeah. And that's much harder, I think, than people want to want to believe it is. Agreed. We do make business harder than it needs to be sometimes. And I think you exactly. know what I subscribe to is simplify, clarify, and connect. And when you do that with clarity, you can engage a lot of people to to do some important work, no doubt. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about you. You told us there at the beginning that um, you are moving into a new um, ownership model from investor capitalists. Yes. Talk about that yep. just a little bit. That's a great that's a great thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. This is one of the good ones. Right. Um, so when we started the company, my my co-founder and I, Stephanie slash wife, I, I'm still figuring out how to say that in 2024. Right. <laughs> so we lived in uh, San Francisco and we had this idea um, to basically we thought of how can we get samples into people's hands and collect data to truly figure out what the return on investment was for a sample packet. Um, the challenge was basically boiled down to sample packets are very cheap and inexpensive to make. And is it were, is the juice worth the squeeze to collect the information back, right? So um, the core problem, what is the value of a sample and hand, handing out samples? And so we had this idea and we went to a couple of investors and this never happens. And, and I used to actually be so embarrassed by the story. I haven't shared it until, you know, the last couple of years, but from concept to actual like 1.5 million in the bank, it was like maybe 67 days. I would argue it was less than that. Um, and that was just a whirlwind, right? And actually our very first pitch for um, investors we got everything we needed and then some. So we were pretty surprised. And I would say, um, looking back, like, you know, we were green, investors were green, no disrespect to anybody, but like, that's just the reality. No, Not a lot of people were doing venture capital in the Midwest, let alone Nebraska. I think Nebraska is like the 48th state consistently for venture capital dollars, right? Um, so we launched um, by any gauge of anything, the metrics were, unbelievable. We were the sixth subscription box, if you will. So there's Birch Box, Dollar Shave Club, et cetera. Um, and we ran with that and we we grew it. And um, I always say this, I accept 100% responsibility as the CEO, but I definitely with time and perspective go, 
oh my gosh, I was talking to software investors about a physical consumer package good, right? Um, and so as we went out to raise more capital, um, it was just really a difficult time. I was talking to the wrong people with the wrong message. Um, you know, it's all clear now, but, you know, in the moment, you're kind of frustrated. So we actually found some people and we built another software. So we had our own subscription box and then we built the software and then that software was actually acquired, which funded the growth on our subscription box. It sounds so simple now, but this was, these were terrorizing years, right? Um, and then we thought, okay, let's just, what's the problem with this subscription box? Um, the marketing costs, the digital advertising costs keep just growing through the roof. How do we solve for that? Well, big brands have budget, big brands have added value, um, marketing dollars, right? Uh, let's just go to big brands and, and figure out if they want this. So boom, GNC takes us up on it. We build a subscription box program for them. Disney number two, they had three programs, Crayola. I mean, it was just one after the other, right? Um, and then the pandemic hits. And what I tell people is, had we been shipping one brand of toilet paper, one, anything that was needed. A lot of people think, oh, you're in logistics. You must have shipped a lot. And, and to that, I say, if you're in the right category or right industry, um, we were in probably a very novel, really difficult to do type of fulfillment and shipping. And so um, a lot of other people got busy. Um, it went quiet for us because the big brands were sorting things out. Um, that's really when the challenge is with like, what's the direction of the company? Um, you know, it was at that point, 10 years or more. Um, and, you know, our investors wanted a return, which we agree with. Right. And so um, working it out for, you know, probably the better part of a year, arguably two years and negotiating, um, we came to a really awesome mutual agreement. I'm forever grateful for them. And it, it was very painful working it out. Uh, but I think everybody came out of the process, a better person, a better leader, a better negotiator, all of those things, all that, you know, the more the pain, uh, the more the kind of like experience and knowledge, right? And now um, my co-founder and I, Stephanie, own hundred percent of the company. Uh, she owns a little more because we are um, on the process to be women owned, led, certified. I'm not a good representation of yeah, our team. Got it, got it. Yeah. And um, so now we are working with um, consumer goods brands of all sizes. And we're really, the way that we view it is we're really evening out the competition field, right? Like we spent a decade learning how big brands were shipping. And now we're taking that to, you know, brands like Buy Optimizers, brands like um, jo Joyride Candies, right? These brands that maybe they did awesome on e-commerce, but they just can't get over the hump and the margins aren't there and the volume, it's just really close. Well, what we do is we'll come in, We'll streamline everything, help them get into retail, help them deliver, help them do subscription, all of the things that you should be doing as uh, consumer goods brands. We actually kind of have the pipeline, if you would, or the plumbing set up for that. And um, I think we've landed like 30 clients in 60 days. So um, yeah, it's a uh, knock on wood. I'm still nervous and I still have a little like Truly, like business PTSD, if that is a thing, um, from negotiating <laughs> for a year or two. Um, but yeah, it's um, things things are good, and we're one foot in front of the other. And the coolest part is, it feels like year three of starting a business, but we actually kind of know what's around the corner, and so it's a it's a good time to be here. Yeah, love it. Great summary for um, where you've been and where you are today, and even some things that you've learned, because that's part of what we want to yeah, talk about absolutely. a little bit today, absolutely. is the learnings and the insight. Yep. Um, and and then maybe, you know, what are you trying to solve today, and where might you grow tomorrow? So oh, yeah. let, let me ask you, with that massive growth, um, let's simplify it into people and process, okay? Yeah. So I heard a lot of process in there and streamlining yeah. and scalability. Can mm -hmm. we tap into the people side of it? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, let's go there. What do, you, what do you look for? How do you build a team? What size of team do you have now? That would be interesting. Yeah, so we went from the full-time, we have a lot of like part-time and different levels of labor, right? I think we have six classifications internally on how we view it. 
Um, so pre-pandemic, we went from uh, the full-time equivalent of over 250 people, and we were growing very exponentially fast. Um, Post-pandemic negotiation, all the challenges and all that, I think we are at 25. And we're, I think there's like three or four new people. So starting now, because we, we really did think um, for a while, the path was going to be like shut it down, right? And so we are kind of slowly doing that, which is a whole nother podcast. Unwinding, series. yeah, unwinding. Yeah. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. We had to, we we found the, some love in the word uh, sunset, right? But I would say that we never viewed it that way, but maybe some other folks did. But we we saw the opportunity. And what I would say is, it's very interesting now going through the experience of arguably ramping up twice and having to cut people. Um, I have never been more involved, critical, um, you know, uh, just it's this thing where I just kind of say to myself, we've grown before and we had to cut down and we kept the absolute rock stars, right? Which is like the positive silver lining in it. Now, because this team that we have of 25 or more um, has gone through, the vast majority of them have gone through kind of, um, can I say curse words, H-E-L-L and back. Um, there is this, I wish it would have been there earlier, but there is this like burning inside of we have to find the right teammates. We don't use family. We don't use, we try not to use employees, right? We try not to use labor teammates because these a players they're seasoned vets now and one they might just eat up a person if they don't meet the level and i would say they have every right to um and number two i i truly feel deep inside like i owe it to our team to find the best people um we will use a couple personality profiles um and that sort of a thing i would say the thing that i probably I'm pretty adamant about is if it's, if they're key positions, we are going to go after people like forget posting, forget reviewing 1400 resumes. Like, nah, we're, okay. we're going to go after people hard. We're going to go in our network and we're going to do what it takes. Right. Um, and then I would say the second part of that is there's just always value in pulling up their LinkedIn profile, randomly pulling off five names and just calling those people or emailing those people and say, like, look, between me and you, we see this, you know, as a great fit, but I don't want to use the references because we all know those are loaded. You know, we all know this, that, whatever. Um, in your own words, you know, just tell me, would do would you hire this person? Do you see yourself working for this person? And I think the moment that we get through all of that, and I can kind of see mentally myself and another like multiverse working for that person that's kind of the moment that I'm like, yep, like, let's, let's do this. Let's go after it. So, um, and I know that process will change as we grow and whatever, but I always feel like up to 40 or 50, it is like truly on like my shoulders and our executive team's shoulders to go get the best people possible. Yeah. This is like a really sensitive subject right now. <laughs> and, and it's important. And I, yeah. I applaud you for getting it because we talk that way where we say people are our greatest assets and yet we know that they don't appear on the balance sheet there like our property plant and equipment um, that depreciates and yet when you invest in your people and your team it appreciates the value of what you're doing yep. and so it is a mindset right it's not an accounting exercise with the generally accounted acceptable principle yep. it's rather how do we create the environment for this? And I hear you loud and clear, and I want to validate that spot on. Uh, yeah. That is your growth strategy. And, and it sounds like it, right? That is your growth strategy for what is next. Yeah. So our, as far as hiring people, yes. um, I'd say up to 50, it's, it's, I would say it's a three person effort, but we're you know, after 12 years, we have a good Rolodex. So that is Beautiful. a big, big advantage. Beautiful. Beautiful. Love that. And, and so the people side of it, then how do you, um, onboard them, train them, and the standard processes that you have, because I heard a lot of testing and measuring, we find what works, right, and there is some standardization to what you do, I would, I would agree, yes? Yeah, actually, so this is the actual 
warehouse behind me. It's not on screen. So, so we can have we're, a we're, lens into it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that, you know, um, if they're on the floor, we call it, and they're physically doing things, there's absolutely a training process. Um, we use EOS, simple documented, followed by all, right? Um, and actually, we we kind of, we talk about it quite a bit because this industry, um, I would say, we're probably one of the leaders in the industry right now because um, of the technology and what we're doing. And um, with that comes a lot of updating the process. So Monday, we actually just in our week uh, leadership team meeting, um, we just reviewed the process for new, we're calling pick and pack people, right? They okay. get an order, they put in a box. And um, we added like a little quiz to it um, and not because, so, you know, they do all the training, they, they have all those things, but we're not calling it a quiz. It's more of, we're going to do a walkthrough interview. Um, and my point of that is like, it's going to be little things like, oh, your boss is sick. Somebody else is sick or, oh, you're out of toilet paper. You know, <laughs> what do you like those types of like actual real day um, mm -hmm. scenarios, which I think is going to be very helpful. Um, and then I would say on the executive side, um, that, that one, I would say we struggle with because we probably need to do, you know, I think by most company standards, we're, we're far away, uh, really great with it because we do have like a one week onboarding, right. And you learn Gmail and you learn Asana and all the tools that we're using. Um, I would say the thing that we're in discussions with is that, um, probably the account managers here are getting a little bit too much of, you know, um, uh, things thrown on their table. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's an invoicing process and it's, we're trying to decide, do we even keep that with them or do we move it to a different department? And, and if you, what we found is if you move things, um, processes or things people are accountable for to different departments, there's actually a trigger of like software changes that need to be made. And um, I would say the the biggest place that we probably fail is um, I would say once we understood that people won't necessarily, we use Asana for project management, people aren't necessarily going to go learn those systems on their own, right? Like, you know, um, there's the platform and there's like the templates for what you do, but as far as how you actually use the entire system, that's where I think we're probably failing a little bit, right? Um, you know, we have a, cal a very different calendar system that the whole company shares, right? And, and I just feel like, you know, the training might be, here's how you add something, but we're not doing ongoing long-term training where it's like, um, change your user, reschedule, you know, check if their calendar is busy. So it's all that little nuance and those things kind of eat away and build animosity. So it's, it's been top of mind, especially now as we're staffing up. Got it. Um, your level 10 meetings and the way that you communicate, um, obviously there's a standard process teaching, yeah. um, teaching your teams to have that that critical thinking skill set to say, okay, how could we improve this? And their suggestions and recommendations closest to the work yeah. uh, is a part of a healthy, high-performing culture. And it sounds like you've got that integrated in your world a bit. Yes. And we also, you know, um, I can't wait to talk to you more about this, but we do actually have an outside coach. Um, right. And we're, we are not shy to hire consultants. And this isn't a shameless plug for you or anything. It's just you really can't put a dollar amount to getting a set of eyeballs that's being paid to care, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, right? Because you do you do learn, even, even if you go five hours in a meeting and you get one thing, that one thing might be able to change. So I, I am a big fan of having outside help mm -hmm. get a peek at all the processes that we're doing. Yes, I'm with you. And, and we call it fresh eyes, right? So so someone go. who's aligned with what you're doing, working the same agenda and the fresh eyes because we get oh. comfortable and yeah. we, we stop seeing things. And um, and so we're with you. There's a role for a consultant to come actually and do work. There's also, you know, what we believe in, which is coaching and that's teaching so that ultimately the investment is a capacity and a capability within that organization to keep building upon it. Yeah. And, you know, that's the space in there where I think a lot of, you know, mid-sized to small and even corporations as they as they think about the culture, 
the culture yes. that you're describing uh, is one of continuous learning and yeah. process improvement and engagement and empowerment and and it's yeah. through your people and process would you absolutely. agree absolutely yeah. we always say uh, you know if we find somebody that's like curious and they have a lot of grit and they can coach and they're coachable that feels a lot like the makeup of uh, a good bulu um culture player right absolutely and culture is there, whether it's what you want and a healthy one or an opportunity to grow it. It will it will eat strategy every time or it will advance and accelerate strategy to exponential growth and unleash potential. Um, yep. And that's a lot of times where people say, well, we just got to hire more people. Well, if you've got good processes to support the good people, right? Yep that it's sometimes it's not always adding more FTEs. It's unleashing the, the potential that's there. Um, and so it's always a joy to talk to people like you, Paul, that get that yeah. and that can assemble a team and also your executive team to create the environment for yeah. your folks to grow and add value. Um, that is your recruitment strategy and it's actually your retention strategy. Yeah, it's amazing to me how big of a mystery culture is for people. Yeah. And honestly, we've won so many awards for that. We get or identified it for wherever. And I don't want to say this, but I'm like, I don't know if we've ever, we've never really put an effort into it. We've never brought a ping pong table. We've never done any of that stuff. Like we don't incentivize because I'm just going to say like, why oh, you want us to buy lunch with your money? Like <laughs> you, you, you probably want to back. And um, I've really dug into that lately. And um people uh, kind of the feedback is like, man, this is the only place I've ever worked where I truly feel like I can be myself. And, you know, they're like, that starts at the top. And I'm like, well, if there's anything that I really value and that I push is like, come as you are. Right. And everybody's different in their own way. But as long as there's always a level of respect for that um, um, and listening, um, I'm just really surprised. It's like, I get nervous because I'm like, ooh, as we grow, I don't want to lose it. But that's like the key elements is like, we're transparent, authentic, and um, we genuinely respect people. And I think deep, deep down, we genuinely just want people to kind of live an optimized life, whatever that might look like, right? Like we just want the best for people as crazy as it sounds, um, even at the risk of giving up some profit because we're in this for the long haul. And it's a different kind of currency. So so when you think about it, all of it put together, we like to meet people in this space. We got good people wanting to do good things. It's usually when something goes bump in the night. It's an underlying process that's yeah. fractured, outdated, needs some attention. And those closest to it are the ones that have the solutions and the engagement. And they will support that what they put their fingerprints on. They absolutely will. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. So um, as I hear you talking about all, all of the opportunity there and to optimize and maximize some of the things that you already have in place, yeah. um, what, is, what does it look like? Are, do you think there'll be a lot of change now that the ownership model is different? Or do you believe that now you have the ability to really grow into that space that the vision that you've been casting with your team? It, it feels like for the first time in a very long time um, that the the vision that I have and um, that's contributed to a lot by my team, um, that there's no barriers in the way. There's nothing holding us back. And and I would say, um, you know, the probably the best thing at all, the, the challenges over the last year or two is um, the team, I think, you know, truly, truly believes and understands like may maybe the CEO does actually see around the corner because every time we kind of, you know, um, find a way to to build the, out the business model, there's kind of a rush of like, let's process that. You know, and I've always kind of been like, it's not done yet. <laughs> like there's more to do. There's more to tap into. And um, for the first time in a really long time, um, you know, I'm, I'm been given that space by my awesome, awesome leadership team um, to keep going and to kind of like really have enough time to explain to people like where we're headed. And um, I think that the biggest learning that I've been, you know, that I'd like to share is that um, 
I've definitely been more of a go fast, go hard. Um, unfortunate. I, I, I would never consider myself a good manager, right? Um, I would consider myself um, almost preferring to work a little bit autonomously, which I dislike. I'm not a rah-rah person, right? Uh, as much as people want to believe it, like it's very strategic. I'd put myself under that kind of like strategy umbrella, right? And um, the thing that really I look back and man, I really fell on my face a lot doing that was it's not, and the best way I can describe it is like, it doesn't help anyone if I'm paddling the boat faster and yelling faster. What actually matters is the cadence of the paddle, that it's in sync with everybody. And I think that that is actually the biggest thing over the last two years. And now we're very cautious to keep that, you know, don't get ahead of our skis. Don't get too out of control going because a lot of people on our team can paddle faster and do amazing things, but it doesn't really actually help other than short term. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've been sharing with a lot of people in my network is, is like, man, it, row the boat, but like row the boat at the same cadence as your team, because if you get out of control, that's when things start spinning if you row too fast. Yeah, there's great wisdom in, in what you say. I like to talk about alignment right? Meet them where they're at and bring them along at the right yep. pace with the right priority, um, mm -hmm. cadence, as you, as you suggest, and consistency in that. Because when they know what to expect, right, yep. they'll they'll then find, oh, let's pick it up here. Let's pick it up there and, and own it. Uh, it's a beautiful um, illustration of, you know, how, what high performing teams can do together. That's yep. beautiful. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you for um, sharing with us. And um, yep. again, the, the wisdom, the insight, uh, celebrating with you, uh, because business should give you more life, not take life from you. Right? Really, that's what it should do. Ooh, I like that. And yeah, and it sounds like you're you're doing that and at least are mindful of doing that with others along the way. Absolutely. The greens are greener. The blues are bluer. Yeah, that's kind of that's what it feels like when everything is is flowing. So I love that. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And um, how can people find you? Do they find you on online or how do they find you? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not hard to find. Um, there's bulugroup.com. There's pauljarrett.com. But, you know, if you've made it this far and you're really curious, you can just drop me an email. It's just paul at bulugroup dot com and probably toss a little emoji in there so i know um you know it's not another sales rep beautiful all right thank you so much paul thank you